is an Australian physician epidemiologist who leads the environmental health research group at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research, nice. University of Tasmania. Her research focuses on the impacts of outdoor smoke from landscape fires and residential wood burning, and strategies for protecting and improving public health. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone, it's great to be here. Thanks to the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, BC Lung Association, Sarah and Mike, who were the people who got me here for this two-week visit, and today's my last day. And I'm going to um, give you some preliminary sort of early results of a work in progress that's part of a project that um, my team in Australia and Sarah and Mike's team here in Columbia, uh, British Columbia, have been working on together. Uh, and, um, and we've had, oh, for about eight or nine years now, a series of collaborations, which is great. I get to come here quite often now. Um, um, and uh, my colleagues at home always make comments when I say I'm coming to Canada, usually about the weather, but often about things like bears, which are really weird because I never see bears. But I often wonder what um, you guys might think when we say the word Australia, what they might say to your colleagues might say to you, whether it might be about hot weather. It's probably not bears. It might be snakes or spiders. Um, it's probably not sheep, but I'll show you this figure. This is a historical map from about 100 years ago showing where the sheep are and aren't. Um, it's not so much for people who are scared of sheep. It's um, indicative of the mindset of early Australian British colonists who came and saw Australia as a great resource for Britain and thought about where they could plant wheat, where they could put the sheep and basically drove all the original inhabitants off their lands, changed all the original land management practices and of course that's had huge reverberations for the country and for the people to this very day, still really being understood. But basically in the Australian context, one of the ramifications was of course um, a massive change in fire regimes. So Australia has had um, a fire problem ever since traditional burning got stopped and fuel loads built up and then we put settlements in highly fire prone vegetation. Uh, and of course now both here and in Australia it's really um, getting interesting as climate change and the fire weather and the windows for burning are all tightening up. So it's a problem that's increasing and getting a lot of um, traction globally. I was ridiculed by a lot of my public health colleagues, I should say, about 15 years ago when I first started thinking about this and now it's become such an important issue in governments in Australia that um, but I'm glad I didn't listen to them. Um, so with fires come smoke and um, we're into a four-year research project funded by the Australian Research Council that's thinking about smoke from landscape fires and the human health impacts and how we manage them. And we've got a lot of parallel things going on both in Canada and in Australia. And I'm going to tell you about some of those. The project um, has four components, understanding the fire ecology, so we're collaborating with um, uh, forestry here in um, UBC and fire ecologists in Australia, population exposure, ways of estimating it, ways of evaluating health impacts, and then the public health end management interventions, surveillance and um, evidence-based sort of interventions. So today I'm going to talk about just two aspects. Um, methods of estimating population exposure to poor air quality and methods that will incorporate and enable you to understand the um, impacts of intermittent exmo exposures like smoke plumes from fires that don't necessarily get captured by background air pollution monitors and evaluating the health impacts and I'll talk about them one by one. Um, my background is public health and epi so the health impacts is more my end and it's other people's work I'm largely presenting today. Um, particularly with the exposure estimates. So um, it actually turns out that British Columbia and our study area in Australia are quite similar in terms of land area, these hectares, and they're also similar in terms of population. And I'm sorry, I couldn't, these are from the internet, but basically we have a lot of empty country in our interior, here coloured white, sparsely populated, a lot of small country towns, mining towns, indigenous communities, and then dense population centres around Sydney here, around Melbourne, more dispersed in Tasmania. Not that dissimilar from British Columbia with big population density down along the south and then a lot of dispersed rural communities. Um, and similarly, this is a comparison of densely forested areas 
and where air monitors might be or might have been in the last um, uh, five years of the um, study where we were estimating this exposure. Um, in Australia, it makes it look better than it is. A lot of the monitors aren't there full time or they monitor one in five days or they um, were there for a year and then left. Tasmania is amazing. We've only got a population of 500,000, but we've got nearly 30 um, PM 2.5 calibrated validated monitors maintained by our EPA. So that's one monitor for every um, 17,000 people. Uh, but that's unusual. Most of the other monitors are concentrated in the city centre and we don't have a lot of information about the risk. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of ways you can estimate population level exposure. Um, so the monitoring network's ideal, like in Tasmania, um, nobody lives too far from a monitor, but we don't know. Prior to 2009 when that got set up, it's hard to look retrospectively. Um, physical atmospheric chemical transport modelling is really useful. In Australia, there's teams who do a lot of this and there's lots of very detailed case studies. But to get a population level exposure across a large geographic area for a large time period is hard because of the computation that's required. Um, so the other approach that was um, uh, first done in this context for this project by Angela here in BC was to use an empirical statistical modelling approach to take e existing available data meteorological remote sense data, monitor data where you have it, and then um, do a model and train the model and get a predictive relationship. So this, um, Angela and Sarah published this a few years ago, 2014, um, an empirical model to estimate daily forest fire smoke exposure over large geographic areas. Um, and I'll show you a few figures from their publication to explain what they did, and then explain how Grant Williamson in our team in Hobart um, with Angela and Sarah, took this model and then tried, well, tweaked it for the Australian situation. Um, so this shows what went in to the BC empirical model. So we monitored data the day before PM 2.5 was available, that was included. Remotely sensed aerosol optical depth. Uh, remotely sensed fire as in fire radiative power. Remotely sent smoke, which is hand-drawn smoke plumes. This is something um, only available here in North America at the moment, so we don't have access to anything like that at present. Uh, venting index, a meteorological indicator of atmospheric venting. We don't actually have that one very comprehensively either, but um, there's something else called the C. Haynes index of atmospheric stability that was substituted. So anyway, you can put these things together and then generate a nice exposure surface that will give you an indication of PM 2.5 across the state. So uh, the question was, can we transfer this concept to Australia and what might need changing and, you know, with our slightly lesser um, data inputs and our less perfect monitoring network, what could we do? So the, um, these are the parameters of the original model as used in BC. Um, performs pretty well. If you just take it, mode training on our data and apply it to southeastern Australia, those three states, not so well, not surprisingly. Um, so then Grant worked a bit and trained it on southeast Australian data, and in fact it didn't really help that much, training on local data. Um, he added a few more variables. The C. Haynes index was one of them. Ozone, because we had it quite systematically, and that, but even that didn't really change much. Um, what did change it was um, deciding not to model it as a linear model, but using machine learning random forest modeling. So allowing non-linear interactions and allowing the computer to figure out what they might be. And that, with the new variables, um, got quite a plausible result. And I'll just show you the scatter plots. So this is with the same data when you use the linear model to predict and when you use the random forest model. So the slope's not quite as perfect, but the, um, the R, R squared is pretty good. So that's all I'll say about that. This um, data, so it's daily data for five years at a five kilometre squared resolution. And then that's what we use to do our health analysis. So I'll now move to um, thinking about how we assess health impacts. And again, um, for... For fires, because smoke is here and there and 
in the time and place and not you don't necessarily know when it's coming. Um, thinking of what would be an ideal population where you've got routinely collected health data because often you don't know they're coming. So setting up a prospective study is often a bit fraught, waiting for a fire and a smoke flame. Um, so ideally you'd have something population wide but it's spatially and temporally resolved. You know where and when the health ailment came on and it's systematically collected, good quality control and it's clinically informative. It tells you something about the health problem or what's going on. In reality, um, most air pollution studies, as you know, look at hospital data sets and mortality data sets because they're there, they're rigorously coded, they tell you about serious health outcomes, um, but the spatio and the temporal information is often poor. Like there's a time series of events to get sick, get to hospital, get admitted and die and it's hard to match that with a fluctuation, particularly short term fluctuation in air quality. Um, the clinical coding is very rigorous, it's ICD-9 and 10 codes. Um, you can get a primary and a secondary diagnosis, but getting a massive data extraction, it's hard to get detailed other clinical information. And anything that's less serious that doesn't require hospitalisation, of course, you won't get from these data sets. In Australia, here's where I often get jealous of my Canadian colleagues. Um, we don't really have a good national system for any primary health care data or pharmacy dispensation data. So that's not readily available to us here, but I know that um, Sarah and her team here have done some, um, a lot of work looking at primary health care attendances and dispensations of things like salbutamol. Um, and then for individual symptoms, again in Australia we're really restricted to prospective clinical studies. It's, there's no, unless you're going the next level and looking at Twitter and crowdsourced kind of data that is across the population, but there's absolutely no kind of epidemiological public health input in the data collection. Um, it's very hard to get that level. So what we're doing in this project is we're thinking about ambulance data, which is something I haven't ever examined before. So um, it's a work in progress, but I'm going to show you where we're up to with this right now. So we've taken grants exposure model. Ambulance data um, are population wide. In Australia each state runs their own but they use um, the same information systems. They do, they're very specific. It, they begin with a call to the emergency phone number. In Australia that's triple zero, I think it's 199 here or 911 or someone will tell me if I need it. Um, and it's geocoded so you've got the precise time down to the second and you've got the lap and the long. So you know where the um, problem was initiated or thought to require medical help. It is systematically collected in some ways in terms of the clinical information systems, but a lot of it, there's no rigorous definitions and ICD coding and training of coders. There's drop down menus which are sort of consistent, but there's also ability for free text. So sometimes you need to do a keyword search on the drop down diagnosis of the paramedic or assessment of the paramedic. So it's, it's not quite, and similarly with the clinical information, a lot of it is symptoms, which is fine, trouble breathing, pain in the chest, um, but a whole host of clinical syndromes can cause these symptoms. So it's partly systematic and partly clinically informative and teasing out what is helpful for um, public health practice is um, part of the challenge. Uh, but it does include a range of health issues and some of them are ones that you couldn't necessarily or the hospital data isn't ideal for. Like um, what's one painting for example, comes up nicely on ambulance data. So uh, what I'm going to show you is a study of the, or the first analysis really that we did of the three southeastern states sort of coloured in these greeny colours, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania uh, for a 10 year period, 2010 to 2015. Um, we did this individually for each state and we put them all in and just did one big combined analysis for the state and then we looked at how the different states vary. And I'll show you all, all that. Um, and we did what we commonly do with hospital or mortality data sets but we used a case crossover design um, that adjusts the day of week and season and long term trends by design. Uh, we had a 5 by 5 PM 2.5 exposure grid as estimated by grants model. 
and so we use conditional logistic regression. So our outputs are an odds ratio for an increased 10 unit rise in PM 2.5. Okay, so in Australia, and I think talking to Angela, it's similar here, there's two um, systems that both collect data. In um, none of the three states of Australia are these linked to each other. You can try and do it retrospectively, and some states have done that. But the first is the dispatch code um, from the Medical Priority Dispatch System, MPDS. This has been around at least since the 70s. It's widely used internationally. I think it began in England um, with the physical card system. And so there are 33 different categories and one was like chest pain and one was eye problems. And now it's all computerised. It's updated every year. There's a big industry with it. Most ambulance systems use it. And in fact, each dispatch is given a reason. And the reasons are numbered 1 to 33. And they actually still correspond to the original little card numbers that were used when the system got developed. And the um, operator who will take the emergency call has a computer assisted system for answering a series of questions and then classifying it according to one of these codes and some other level of priority codes. So that's one system. The other, I'll go through our results one by one with these systems. The other is the paramedics primary assessment and that uses an information system usually done by iPad and once the paramedic who's attended the scene has done a clinical evaluation, uh, they enter it on this iPad. It was developed in Melbourne and it's actually used across most of Australia and I'm not sure at all how comparable it is to those used in other countries. But it um, gives spaces for you know putting in the temperature and the pulse and the blood pressure. It's got a series of clinical protocols. So paramedics are highly trained um, in recognising certain clinical syndromes, particularly those that need immediate attention, and follow protocols to implement that and transfer people safely. So some aspects of this are fantastic and clear and consistent, and other aspects are not, because there's a whole lot of things that happen to people that are really hard to diagnose, they're hard to diagnose at the best of time, but if they don't fit into an acute chest pain, acute myocardial infarction protocol, um, paramedics won't necessarily allocate it anything or they'll allocate it unknown or no problem identified. You know, and there's a lot of conditions with clinical overlap that are, you know, there's not agreement amongst physicians about how you might classify asthma and COPD in some people, for example. So the conventions amongst the different states are different. Anyway, this was data availability. Um, the ambulance dispatch codes is the emergency callouts. New South Wales, it actually goes for 10 years. In fact, all of them. This has been in operation for a long time. This gap here is where they changed from uh, paper recording to electronic recording. And callouts just dropped for 20% for 18 months. So at the moment it's excluded, but we're going to do some sensitivity analyses around that. The actual way of allocating codes didn't change at all. It was just how they collected the information. Um, and New South Wales, again, only started the VACUS, which is the paramedic assessment database, in 2013. So that's quite a short time period. Um, and I should probably remind you the population for New South Wales, the combined population is about 13 million, or half Australia's population. 7 million in New South Wales and 5.5 .5 million in Victoria. So the population really dominates in these two states and Tassie's just 500,000. But we've got fantastic exposure and we've probably got consistent conventions in allocating diagnoses. Okay, so dispatch codes. Um, these are the 33 cards or codes uh, that were available to us. The services wanted us to tell them. They didn't want to give us the whole lot, sadly. I would have quite liked to have them all. But um, we picked the ones that we knew might be related to cardio or respiratory or metabolic problems because from the wider uh, literature, they, they would be the ones um, you know, more likely to be worth looking at. So we picked these six categories. So breathing problems, cardiac or respiratory arrest or death, chest pain, diabetic problems, heart problems, and this is other heart problems such as 
palpitations or implanted defibrillator problems. If it's heart attack or chest pain, it would probably go under 10. And um, stroke or transient ischemic attack. And I have to keep picking myself up because these look like really kind of clinical diagnoses. And I'll, towards the end, I'll show you a spreadsheet of what some of the paramedic assessments were compared to this. There have been some studies showing um, those code 9 cardiac arrest do correlate quite well with cardiac arrest. There's also a few dead bodies, old dead bodies that have been found, but mostly it is cardiac arrest. And the stroke one tends to, where there's been separate studies in the literature where there has been data linkage to say something given a code 28 by the person taking the call who hasn't seen the patient, there's a, a majority do end up being stroke or transient ischemic attack. For those of you who might not know that is where it's symptoms of a stroke that get better after a few minutes, whereas a stroke is a long-term long deficit. And these are the relative numbers, and this is for the three states combined. So call-outs, emergency call-outs for breathing problems and chest pain are probably the two most dominant categories across the board, including the road traffic accidents and other things that um, ambulances go to. So the median for both was around 300 call-outs per day. And 300 represents about 15% of the total emergency call-out workload. Chest pain a little less. So together it was between 25 to 30% of all ambulance call-outs. But you can see the enormous range for this off top. And then far fewer arrests, diabetic problems, other heart or stroke. And you'll see with the um, confidence intervals we've got that um, reflects these numbers, particularly when you look in the small state of Tasmania. So that we had six outcomes, and it's a composite plot here, so I'm just showing you one by one, um, and I'll explain what we have. So this is showing the odds ratio with the lines where you see them, 95% confidence limit. Some, like here, the circle on the left represents all states combined, and then the next three represent the three states. New South Wales, Tasmania and Victoria. Uh, and this is an odds ratio of one where the line is. So usually I can look at the confidence intervals and see if they reach or cross one and it can tell me about significance. These confidence intervals were so little here, for example, the dot representing the point estimate is wider than the confidence intervals. So bold represents a P of less than 0.05, just for this slide, actually not for the future slides. So the first group is same day associations second group is after a lag of one day, and the third one is after a lag of two days. And um, we did test the heterogeneity and difference, and you didn't really need to test, because you'll see Tasmania is quite often an outlier in some of these results, the square being Tasmania. But anyway, we're kind of seeing what we expected here. People having trouble breathing. Um, same day at a lag of one day, at a lag of two days. We're seeing it right across the board. It's roughly 3 to 4 percent, except in Tasmania. Um, breathing problems can mean a whole host of things, but that didn't surprise us, and that was reassuring. If, if we're not seeing something there, then probably the data we've got to work with isn't good enough. Um, chest pain, again, this one's harder to see, but we did get a result, a small result, about a 2 percent rise, same day and at a lag of two days when we combined the data, and the state that it really showed up in was Victoria. Um, diabetic problems was interesting. This is where Tasmania really went out on a limb, even more than with anything else. Um, but it was interesting for such a relatively infrequent category that it came up so consistently across all three states. Same day, lag of one and a lag of two. Diabetic problems um, I've talked at length with the ambulance service about it. It doesn't necessarily mean a problem of the disease diabetes. It means that the person who rang the operator mentioned the person had diabetes. And then it's a person with diabetes who's got some kind of ailment. So some of these might be due to direct diabetic complications. A lot of them will be due to trouble breathing or a cut or you know, falling over in the person who happens to have diabetes. Either way, it lights up... Uh, quite consistently. The other heart problem, that's a bit of a sort of grab bag of categories that we just got a signal in Tasmania, so it's hard to 
make much sense of that one. Uh, similarly with arrest, cardiac arrest and out-of-hospital cardiac arrests have been looked at a bit more in association with air quality and studies based on other Victorian data sets have found fairly clear associations. In, um, although this one and only result seemed to come from Tasmania. The studies from Australia used a separate research-based cardiac arrest register, which the paramedics also have to fill in. And I think in this case, um, this is the dispatch code, which may or may not represent the ultimate diagnosis. Um, but also I think when I show you the paramedic assessments, if it was arrest, they tended not to fill in that form or just write deceased and put the detailed information in the cardiac arrest registry. So I'm not totally confident of these data that we worked with here. And final one, stroke. Um, contrary to a lot of air pollution studies, um, call-outs categorised as stroke didn't have a signal. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to the second data set the paramedic assessments. So these are when the paramedic has seen a person, taken a history, followed examination protocols and then enters it in the database. As part of that they entered two things. One is called their final primary assessment and the other is called their final secondary assessment. And what that basically means, the final primary is like their principal diagnosis or the main assessment. Final secondary is other things that might be going on. And what we looked at was the final primary assessment. And I think here it might be called impression, paramedic impression. And we just looked at the data to see what were the more common ones and which ones related to cardio, respiratory or diabetic um, problems. And um, these are the ones we chose to analyse, along with anxiety, which it isn't mentioned here. We included anxiety because that was a common reason paramedics came, gave for shortness of breath and breathing difficulties, which did have a signal. So again, most of these are clinical assessments, the diagnostic sort of um, guideline, but you can see here the most common one of all is short of breath, which is a symptom which can have many reasons, including chest problems, but also it's a, the main symptom you get if you're heart is failing and not pumping well and fluid is building up on your lungs. So we also looked at this symptom of shortness of breath. And numbers range 8 to 69. And that's across the state. So when we're getting to Tasmania, we're getting quite noisy, unstable results. So I'll show in groups, breathing and respiratory problems first, and looking at that category where the paramedic has decided someone's short of breath but can't make a call if it's heart or lung or what type of lung problem. And what we see there is, um, in this one, I should be clear, the bold doesn't mean significant, it means combined all three states. So the first um, in each of the group of four is the three states combined results. And then the next three are the New South Wales, Tas and Victoria. It's a bit easy to see the confidence limits and how they relate to one in these and shortness of breath um, actually did have a signal again, the small one across all three states. Asthma I thought would come out loud and clear and it did in um, Tasmania uh, at lags of one and two days and in Victoria at a lag of one day and combined it came out but it wasn't quite as strong as I expected. COPD, chronic lung disease, another one known to be really sensitive to poor air quality. Again varied a lot by state, but in general we got associations. Croup was an interesting one. Croup um, is a disease of childhood. It only affects kids under the age of five. It's in response to an infection. It's often treated in the same way asthma is treated. Um, because it was a more frequent diagnosis, the thing is it's really clearly, it's easy to diagnose in terms of it's a clinical syndrome, it's a certain age group, and there's this really characteristic high-pitched barking cough that goes with it and it's worse at night. So it's, it's one where we did get consistency across all the states and it did seem very sensitive to poor air quality as well. So that one gave me a bit of confidence that we're probably dealing with something consistent there. Whereas I think this last one is chest infection and again 
Tasmania is standing out and the other states aren't. But the reality is there's a lot of diagnostic overlap between these three conditions and it may be convention in Tasmania to call something a chest infection or asthma and not quite to call it COPD. So I think we might collapse these down to respiratory diagnoses as we explore these data a bit further. So moving to cardiovascular outcomes. Acute coronary syndrome is another one that's consistently diagnosed and managed. So this is the term that includes heart attacks and terminology for heart attacks has changed over the years, but basically it means loss of blood supply to the heart. It often causes chest pain, it often doesn't, um, which then causes a bit of the heart muscle to die. And if you get rapid treatment, you can often clear the blockage. And we've got very good at rescuing people from the brink with these things and putting in stents and doing procedures. So it's time critical and paramedics are highly trained in recognising they put on an ECG they can read the ECGs and manage. So I've got a lot of confidence in this as an outcome compared with some of the others. And with this, we actually did get a signal same day and at a lag of day two um, when we had the pool data across the three states, but not with um, individual ones. And Gyne is a bit related to an acute coronary syndrome, but it's reversible. It's chest pain that can come and go with impaired blood flow to the heart. And again, borderline associations, same day and a, a lag of day one. Fainting came up um, clearly and consistently across the three states as a same day association with um, call for an ambulance that the paramedics diagnosed as a faint. Arrhythmias or dysrhythmias, things that might give you palpitations, atrial fibrillation. Again, there's been some studies that show heart rate, heart rate variability and rhythms are so, can be associated with air quality. And that was a slightly um, more consistent same day association. And heart failure. Heart failure has come up quite a lot in some of the work we've done looking at different data sets. So at a lag of um, one and two days it came up looking at ambulance call out. The final one, cardiac arrest, no signal at all when I'm this is, I'm a bit sceptical of the quality of our data here, but if anything, a protective effect, which doesn't quite make sense. So finally, cere cerebrovascular, this is stroke and TIAs. We didn't actually, a bit of a positive trend in, in uh, Victoria, but we didn't really get a signal on either of those in this analysis. Um, and diabetic outcomes. Um, which I included looking at hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Right? There's an ideal range of sugar in your blood. If it goes below that ideal range, you call it a hypo. And if it goes above, you call it a hyper. If it goes low and is hypo, you definitely get symptoms. And in people with diabetes, that can, depending on their state, that can be an emergency. It's a common thing paramedics or ambulances get sent out for. And most of the time they will treat with an injection of glucagon or IV glucose. The person will come back and stop being confused and dizzy or wake up. And then they won't transfer them to hospital because they'll have their primary care physician and they'll eat a bit of food. And It's one that you don't get good information about if you look at hospital records, acute low blood sugar. Um, but here it's one of the clearest and consistent associations um, and I haven't, looking in the literature, I haven't seen any hypoglycemia. There are studies emerging with diabetes and air quality, usually poor diabetic control, hyperglycemia, rates of admissions in people who've already got diabetes. Because as soon as you're sick, if you've got diabetes, if you're sick with any other thing, like a heart attack or an infection, your blood sugar will go up and it'll be noted in hospital. So this was, with people with diabetic problems, about 30% it was due to hypoglycemic callouts. And depending on the state, it was paramedics would call hyperglycemia in 5 to 10% of cases. I'm a bit more sceptical of this. It's obviously something Tasmanian paramedics call a lot. But, but as I said before, heart and lung disease, uh, we know are sensitive to the effects of air pollution. If you've got diabetes, it's going to put your blood sugar up. High blood sugar doesn't usually cause any symptoms at all. It's not quite the medical condition that low blood sugar is. So some of this might well be 
someone who's got another ailment that might be associated with air quality and they've noted a higher blood sugar and then called the primary assessment high blood sugar. That was a bit less consistent across the states. And just finally to show you um, mental health issues, anxiety and panic attacks, um, a relatively common reason, I'll show you, you'll see what I mean by relatively when I show you the next slide, but no association. So it can cause hyperventilation, breathing, shortness of breath, the need for an ambulance, but we didn't really see any um, clear pattern of association with air quality. So what does it mean? I mean, to me it means be very careful. These are preliminary and these data sets are much messier than others I'm used to working with. And the We haven't got linked data. You might have it here to be able to actually compare a paramedic assessment with a later medical diagnosis, which would be helpful because I think if we can find some things that we're confident of, there's a lot we can learn from these data sets. But different states, different conventions, maybe we need to combine some categories. So I'm a bit cautious about making too much of it at this stage. But I just want to show you this. We did for New South Wales where we were able to match the data for I think a one year period. And across the top, and this is between the dispatch code and the paramedic assessment, so it's not a diagnosis. Um, so if it was a dispatch for an arrest, it was actually rare for the paramedic to call it an arrest. They either called it deceased or an altered conscious state. If it was for breathing problems, you say breathing problems and you know I can't help but think asthma or chronic lung disease. Um, you look down here, someone with breathing problems and you can see asthma and it's less than 10% and COPD is less than 5%. You know, that's clearly not driving or not commonly allocated. What what paramedics do call it is short of breath, pain, unknown problem, no problem identified, unknown. So we're working with a lot of unknowns here, I guess. Similarly, chest pain, about 15, maybe 20% might ultimately get called an acute coronary syndrome. Okay, so um, just to conclude, we've seen clearly seen some large variation between the states that we need to think more about, but we're also seeing some overall patterns and the overall patterns we're seeing are consistent with the general body of evidence, so I think it's worthwhile pursuing this. Um, breathing problems, respiratory problems, heart problems and diabetes, um, which is an um, emerging area. But I think it's a, a good tool for the low blood sugar event. Uh, so what next? Clearly we're going to do a bit more work on this, but Angela is planning to do something very similar looking at the VC data sets and it will be interesting to see how clean or messy or similar or different it is here. Um, if we do find a really good association, it will be, because it's so clearly time stamped and geocoded, it's a good data set if we, asthma or maybe hypoglycemia to look at hourly associations, short term responses. There's not many sort of statewide national data sets that give you that ability. And it might mean if we can get a frequent outcome like dispatches for breathing problems there could be a role there in surveillance, particularly more distant places um, of, of surveillance of public health impacts even in closer places. Um, we may have some messaging here. Maybe we need to be a bit more explicit in mentioning diabetes when we give public health messages and feedback for ambulance services about what, um, what they might expect during, I mean they usually see it anyway but, um, in smoke events. So anyway, um, thanks for that. Thanks for having me here today and um, to our collaborators and funders. I'd especially like to acknowledge Grant Williamson and Farhad Salimi who did a lot of the work I've presented today. And I'll leave it there for questions. This is an area of Australia where there are no sheep. But anyway, so, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Faye, for the interesting presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Thanks, uh, Faye. Really, really interesting. Um, so, a, a comment, I, I guess, on a question. So, the comment is, I, I mean, I think, um, I mean, it's interesting to try and, you know, look at the the specific um, causes. But, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't downplay the um, importance of just having a signal. Period. 
Um, so when you, I, you know, you alluded to sort of collapsing, I think collapsing into cardiovascular or even cardiopulmonary, um, just seeing, you know, it seems like you do have a, a, a signal, yeah. which is which is pretty impressive, actually, which is in what I would say is pretty noisy data, and it's always going to be uh, noisy data. Um, so I was, oh, I was actually, thank you. I think it's impressive, actually. Um, the doctor in me wants to know why, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think without linkage, um, but you know, even if you have linkage, I mean, it's not like we don't have the same problems with um, you know mortality coding or hospitalization coding, right? So, um, trying to really understand exactly what was happening in these population, you know, administrative data sets is mm. challenging. Right? Mm. The the question I had was actually it kind of relates to what Angela is doing, which is trying to get in more fine time. Uh, so what did you actually do in terms of allocating the calls to the day? Like, was it just on the day? Did you make sure it was actually after, um, you know, your exposure is on a daily basis? So this is daily. Yeah, so yeah. you could have actually had situations where um, a smoke plume actually went um, through after um, yes. a dispatch. we could have. This is PM from all sources, and smoke plumes are relatively rare, but yes, yeah. we certainly could have. Okay. And I don't think we'll be able to develop an hourly model like Angela is, but we could use Tasmania, where we've got real-time network in PM. Yeah, I guess it's, look at hourly. Yeah, it's more yeah. relevant for fire smoke plumes, yes. like where, that, where you yeah. do get these really transient things and you want to make sure, and you, and you know, this is rare that you have the data where you actually have the time set. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Wade. I hope that I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just curious uh, why Tasmania is so different. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I remember you talked about how like the underlying risk, like the very different population, and well, that also related to how people are using ambulance like differently. Any thoughts? Yeah, it could. I think there's three big factors that could all contribute to it. One is that Tasmania is an older, sicker, more disadvantaged population that um, so overall would be like a socioeconomic disadvantaged area of a great big city. So the, the population risk is probably higher on average than the other two places. Um, use of ambulances could well be different because of that. Transport and car ownership and those kind of things might, so it might increase ambulance workload. The other is it's very small and the conventions among paramedics in how they call things are probably a bit more similar than all across those other two states because there's one training system, one, so, so which leads to consistency uh, that you might not get. And the other is we're really confident the model is driven a lot by the monitor data, the actual estimates we get. Tassie, we've just got this fantastic network of real-time monitors, so I think the exposure estimates Estimates for Tasmania in particular are much better, so there'd be less exposure misclassification for that state. So I think those three are just all feeding into each other for some of those outcomes. That noisiness because it's small numbers, a wide confidence limit. Hey, hey, thank you. Um, this is really interesting. Um, so I have a question that's related to Angela's question. I was wondering about the age distribution around across the three states and if that played a role. So do we see the same age distribution in Tasmania and the two other states? And could that explain the differences that you see? My second question is one where uh, it's more of a clarification point because I'm trying to wrap my head around your cardiac arrest results. So the way I understand it is like there's very little room for misclassification of diagnosis, the cardiac arrest, the cardiac arrest, right? So yes. could you help me understand that, uh, that result? Um, first question first. Age distribution is similar, but on average Tasmania is older. So but the you know the pyramid is pretty similar if you look at all three states. Um, with cardiac arrest Yes, the clinical syndrome is very, very clear, but what a paramedic might put in the database might not be the word 
cardiac arrest. And in fact, in the example I showed you, that was done in less than 10% of cases and that's what was searched on and analysed. So I think it's reasons like that. that it, it, and it's relatively infrequent as well, so I think we're just... I'm not at all confident of those results. I don't think they mean much at this point. Uh, we have an online question uh, from Sarah. Was the really bad fire year in Tassie included in the analysis? Yes, it was, 2014. And um, I've got another student who's actually looking at that particular episode with ambulance data sets and we'll have some results from that soon. But she actually did see a link with stroke just to three months of severe fires, or one month, sorry, of severe fires in Tasmania. And she looked at hourly associations as well with that. I was just curious if there was a comment section on the paramedic reports. Uh, so if someone had a breathing problem, like if it was, if they can, if there was a comment on, it was from like, I don't know, uh, like a house fire or something like that. Uh, like is there any other, is there a way There's endless free text that they can add and it goes into the same box as their drop down menu. So yes, but it would be logistically a nightmare to try and search and pull out those kind of things. All right. Thank you, Faye. And would you join me in another round of applause for Faye, please? <laughs>